So. Everybody's talking about you. In my opinion, I saw you for the first time live at CZW about two or three weeks ago, and I was totally blown away, and uh, all the hype is true. In my opinion, I've been around the business for like 25 to 30 years. I think you are the next big thing. It's just a matter of you getting signed and going to WWE, and you know, you're know you a hell of a talent. So. You know, thank you. You know, big. I think a big thing right now, I think I'm really lucky with how the indies are and the WWE and how everything's working out. Because I feel like it, maybe it wouldn't be the best thing for me to get signed right away right now. But I think where I'm at right now on the Indies working all over Europe and everywhere else, I think this is like the perfect opportunity for me and the perfect time. I think I, I everything just happened at the right time. Yeah, you have plenty of time. Yeah, you know, I was big into the pro wrestling. At that time, of course, nobody's just going to let me go into a school. or I didn't even know where to look. You know, this was before the internet was even big. You know, this was when like a GIF was a whole video. Right. You know, so like... I, I, you know, I saw it on TV. I'd get the cookie trays, the steel chairs from school. We'd sneak them out, you know, and we'd have hardcore matches at my house. Of course, nothing as big as some of the other ones I saw. It was more like a couple buddies come over. We hang out, play video games, wrestle, and, you know, which was which because it was before Sure Dog even had their stuff together. And nobody had their stuff together. There's barely any athletic commissions at the time. You know, and uh, did the tryout, did the interview, killed it, and uh, called me about a couple of months later and asked me if I wanted to be a TV star. And of course, I was like, I was living on my parents' couch, so I was like, hell yeah. And that was the beginning of that. What was it like living in that house with all of those people? You know, most people, when they talk about the ultimate fighter, they're like, the house sucks. I was there for eight weeks, couldn't talk to my family, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. My wife, my girlfriend, my kids, whatever. Well, I was like 21, 22 years old at the time. And I literally just turned 22. And uh, it was... It was I, I, I like Rampage, you know. Do I like him as a coach? Definitely not. I don't think he's the best at strategy or even coaching a team, you know. I think and I, that, that would go for a lot of people. You can be a world-class fighter, wrestler, jiu-jitsu practitioner and not be a great coach. But, you know, Rampage, great fighter, definitely not one of the greatest coaches I've had in my, you know, in my MMA career. Yeah. And and then, I'll be honest, 22-year-old Matt wasn't as respectful as, you know, 30-year-old Matt or 29-year-old Matt was. So, I, you know, it wasn't that I was disrespectful, but I had an arrogance to me that they probably didn't like, you know. I think that's why we butted heads. And me and Dante argued about steroid use in professional sports all the time. He thought Barry Bonds was okay by <laughs> saucing and breaking records. And I was like, I don't mind that he sauce and he plays, but his record should be thrown away because, you yeah. know, you know, TV was a live fight, you know, like, which is pretty cool, your first pay-per-view, your, your first fight live on Spike TV, you know, so I was really excited, honestly, I like Dante, I like most of the people I fight, so, like, that, you know, that's kind of hard when you know you're going to beat somebody and they're probably going to get fired, but at the same time, like, I knew what I had to do, I knew where my career was going, he was at the end of his career, I was at the beginning of mine, and, you know, it was my time, but, uh, so I did a lot of stand-up that camp. So I planned on standing with Steve Bruno. I had a reach on him. I was like, I think I got this. Well, I go out there. Steve Bruno hits me with an overhand right. Didn't drop me or anything, but I was like, well, that kind of hurt. Then he hit me with another one, and I saw the room move a little bit. And I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm taking him down. Even though I had knee surgery, I was like, I think my wrestling is going to win this one. I took him down and beat the shit out of him for the rest of the fight. I actually I don't have the record or I might have the record for most strikes landed in a round. Most of the time, us fighters are already training and we're ready to go, so I think it's more than fair. And it's not like Sean Pearson was training for Matt Riddle for eight weeks, you know? So, True. hey, that if anything, that's more fair than anything because it's short notice. It's a real fight. You know, it's a real fight, you know? I'll say this. When you get fight of the night and you get an additional, like, $70,000 check yeah. handed to you that night, and... And I'll be honest, if you watch the tape, if you hear the crowd, they announce that Lance Benoist won, crowd starts booing, and then I hop on the cage and I start going like this, the crowd starts cheering. Already had the pro wrestling stuff going, <laughs> you know? But uh, I think that fight, like, in, in like, pride, I would have won. Yeah. 
especially when you're letting fighters use testosterone and painkillers and Adderall and Ritalin and everything else they can get prescribed by a doctor, you know. So, uh, you know, to them, I don't think it was a big deal. I think when it became a big deal was when I was vocal about it. And then, right. two, it's, he's a kickboxer. It's like, why am I going to stand, like, I don't want to get kicked or punched in the face if I don't have to. Like, if you're, like, a good striker, that's one thing. But if you're, like, a K-1 level kickboxer and you've, like, knocked out K-1 guys, it's like, why am I going to kickbox with you? No, I'm going to clinch and wrestle you and beat you up because I'm really good at that. I'm, like, one of the best in the world at that. So that's what I'm going to do. Back, you know, because I'm one of the top ten fighters in the world right now. That's where I was ranked. How do I get back? How do I get back in action? How do I fight? Like, how do I do this? And, you know, and I have bills to pay. I had a house. I had a car. I have three kids at this point, you know. So I need to make money, you know. So, I, you know, I wasn't mad at the UFC because I knew where they were coming from. They were pissed because I was talking. And they knew I had steam. They need, they want, I felt like they felt like they need to get rid of me. Like, He's his head's getting too big. Like fuck this guy. Like he's he's gonna be a monster to deal with. You know, if he's not even gonna slide on this, what else isn't he gonna slide on? Like, and I think that's what- you know, like why are you drug testing for this drug? It's not even the the drug testing. It's like you can drug test for a drug. Say if I fuck up on the job, I would want you to. But at the same time, it's how they're drug testing. They they doing urine tests, and the way they test for cannabis is outdated. It, this it's in your system for three weeks afterwards. They should be doing if anything blood work you know these people should be really getting tested for stuff that stays in your blood longer like steroids hgh other things like that you know fights what? who cares it's like oh you sign a contract to a wrestling promotion you might wrestle who cares like unless you're guaranteed dates and money your contract doesn't mean shit and even so it's like you might have a decent contract and you might get a better offer down the road like in a year and you signed a three-year contract now you gotta wait two years and maybe those are your two best years You know, so it's like, just for FYI, everybody, contracts aren't the greatest thing. Know your value and, like, the time's right when the time's right, you know. In some trouble, we can definitely pay you the 5 and 5. I'm like, well, my contract's for 10 and 10. Well, long story short, Bellator buys my contract from Legacy. And they signed me for 10 and 10. Well, things happen. I was supposed to fight in the tournament. I cracked a rib. So I couldn't enter the tournament. Personally, like I said, man, like I was pissing blood and uh, cutting weight was re- really hard for me. And just, and not just like physically, it was physically dominating, but like mentally, like, and like, uh, I was watching WrestleMania, I was watching Daniel Bryan kill it, you know, and the rest of the card. And I was like, you know what? Like, I've always wanted to do it. It's like, I feel like maybe this is coming full circle. I feel like MMA, like, I keep running into an obstacle, like something keeps happening, be it this or that. And, you know, and I was already thinking about it, like even before the Saunders fight fell through, I was already thinking, like, after I win this title, I'm going to bring this title to pro wrestling. Like, I was already thinking about doing it. So, you know, and then I went to Ring of Honor and I did the tryout seminar and I liked it there. I liked it a lot there, but it was only open like two days a week and sometimes it wasn't open at all like, and I'm you know what i'm saying like the champions it's hard to follow you know and they don't promote their athletes as much as they promote the brand ufc the only guy i know right now is like conor mcgregor and ronda rousey you know well they should be promoting their athletes you know and i think that's where the ufc is going and still going in that direction and i think they'll make money but at a certain point they're gonna i think they're gonna start losing money you know and then i'm a really proud person you know it's one of the main reasons why i didn't keep my mouth shut about trt it's the reason why i didn't quit using i did and the thing is i wasn't asking to get high in europe on the fight plane or the fight bus or anything like that i was like if i'm in training camp if i'm at my house and i'm prescribed my medicine I should be able to use medicine I'm prescribed, especially a medicine that's never killed anybody in the history of its existence. I should be able to use this medicine. Yes. You know? The list goes on. Other people have failed drugs for cocaine, John Jones, you know. Other people have like literally beaten their wives and been arrested. All these people keep their jobs. And then the one dude who had a medical marijuana license that's on like a four fight win streak in the UFC gets fired. Like I just I I was I was more upset about that, like that, and 
as a professional former MMA fighter going into pro wrestling and liking to get physical, while a lot of pro wrestlers don't like to get physical or they like to do more of a comical angle or whatever their gimmick is, you know, which is perfectly fine because it's perfect for me because I know nobody else is going to do what I do on any card like me. Even if you're, like I said, they got pretty good connections. And, you know, and uh, Sean Waltman, X-Pac, heard that I was there training and figured, you know, I don't know if he was told or if he just came by or what have you, but he came by to see what the scuttlebutt was about, and he liked what he saw. He got in the ring with me. We chained. We wrestled. We did some moves. I showed him some sequences that he really enjoyed. He just told me what I needed to add or what not to add, da 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 da, da. And then uh, shortly after that, like, you know, I got a trial at the, you know, the WWE. And uh, so, uh, Triple H came up to me at an Evolve event after I wrestled Tracy Williams, I think the second time for the Styles Battle Championship. And he goes, hey, man, I just want to thank you, you know, I, I, or I appreciate what you're doing. I go, I appreciate what you're doing. And he goes, all right, I, I want to thank you for everything. I go, I want to thank you for everything. And he just looked at me. He shook my hand. <laughs> And walked away. And I was like, you know, and the funny thing is, Blue Mini always told me, if you ever get a chance to talk to Triple H or Vince McMahon, you got a one-minute elevator pitch. So, like, you know, you got to say all the right things, do this and that. And I completely <laughs> blew my one-minute elevator pitch. I just repeated every word he said back to him until he awkwardly walked away. That's awesome. So, that was, like, that's, my- holy shit, like. This guy is the next Kurt Angle. And then some people are like, he's better than Kurt Angle, you know? And the best part is, I'll tell you guys this, I'm not even doing half the shit I can do yet. You know, it's just, I got to save some for next year, you yep. know? You got to save it for Mania 34. That's right. <laughs>